All right, welcome back inside a, another episode of Podcast PD. It is uh, still COVID EBU happening right now. We're all still under quarantine. It is 8.30 on a Sunday night. It's May 3rd, 2020. And uh, I'm hanging with my podcast compadre. And we've got a couple of awesome friends with us tonight as well. But first, AJ, what's going on, man? What is going on out there in the podcast world? Thank you, everybody, for joining us again for episode 73. We have some wonderful, wonderful guests with us tonight. Things are well on my end. It was beautiful this weekend, and uh, we spent a lot of time outside. How about you, Chris? Also, a lot of time outside. I didn't do the three-mile walk you did with your oh, family. It was yes, four. Four, four, mile. four. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> four-mile <Impressive>. walk. <laughs> but I oh. definitely got outside. Got the uh, got the scooters out, so the uh, the Jersey Shore Bat Cycle was running around this weekend. <laughs> uh, for those who don't know, I do have a Vespa like scooter. I say Vespa like because it's not a Vespa because I make a teacher's salary. <laughs> we'll get you there. We'll get you. Yeah, there. We'll, we'll get we'll get there at some point. Um, so we are we are rocking and rolling tonight. We are on podcastpd.com slash live, but you might also be tuning in via Facebook, and if that's the case. Feel free to comment, feel free to join in, feel free to participate in the conversation, and I will certainly be able to see your comments and get them on screen, but if you want the full immersive experience, head over to podcastpd.com slash live, and let, let's introduce our, our guests for right now, and we're joined by two educators, two podcasters, and two people who have no shortage of opinion and ideas <laughs> that could change the world of education. And, and I will certainly go ladies first. We are joined tonight <laughs> by Batsheva Frankel. Batsheva Hi. is an educator and a podcaster. And please tell us a little bit more. Wow. Um, yeah, I've been in education for over 25 years and uh, I have been as many, many educators are as we develop and as we continue to grow. Um, I've been working with uh, Jim Hahn from Arte Preparatory Academy, and we started the Arte Institute. You can see it scrolling up right there. And, um, and we decided that there were so many great things that we knew that were happening out there in education. We wanted everybody to be able to uh, know about those things, advocate for those things. And uh, yeah, I'm, as you mentioned, I'm very opinionated about what I think great education could and should be. And so that's why we wanted this sort of provocative title of overthrowing education for the podcast, because we feel like um, there's a lot of good out there, but there's a lot of things that need to be changed and reexamined and some things thrown out entirely, some things just refined. And so that was kind of the impetus for the podcast. And also I like to have a lot of fun. Um, I know you all know that we do a lot of goofy things on the show as well. We have faux commercials, which are commercial parodies um, for products, educational products that we wish were real. And, um, and I have all my guests have to play the five minute game show that I write specifically for them and that day's topic. So it's a lot of fun as well as, um, because like good education, I wanted it to be engaging and informative. So there it is. AJ, Tim, we, we both know Tim, but I'll oh. be honest, you know Tim just a little bit better than I do. So why don't you go ahead? No, we got a gentleman who is heating up. And I use that as a fun. See what I did there? <laughs> Tim KV nice. educator from the other coast. So we're, we're bringing in some new life to this podcast. Tim KV. <laughs> wow. Coast on fire. <laughs> Tim, yeah. what's going on, man? Thanks so much for coming in tonight. My pleasure. No, I, I've watched a, a couple editions of the show and I, I've just been so impressed by the the production quality and the conversations here. So it's a pleasure. It's an honor to be here. My name is Tim Cavey. I'm an eighth grade teacher in Surrey, BC, Canada, and I'm the host of the Teachers on Fire podcast, which profiles agents of growth and transformation in K-12 education today. And I'm just really enjoying the PLN. I'm enjoying conversations with other educators and uh, just actually just published an episode today featuring someone from the New York City area. So there you go, over on the East Coast. There you go. Tim, thank, thank you for all that you've done. Your podcast is 
definitely growing in numbers and uh, and we love we'll talk about this i'm sure but the instagram feed is, is blowing up as well and and uh <laughs> chris you'll love this tim is new to the TikTok. and the gary <laughs> v disciple here we got another gary v guy nice i a huge Gary V fan, and you know I could do without some of his vocabulary, but I love his ideas and his energy, <laughs> and he always sort of kicks me in the butt when I need when I need to uh, shake my fears of perfectionism. And and we're all creators here, so we get that right. And yeah, I love Gary, and yeah, um, who was the other person you just mentioned? Me, uh, yeah, Chris. Chris is <laughs> a big Gary V guy as well. That, that guy. There we go. All the, all the production. Uh, and uh, well, T Tim, thank you for being here. Batsheva, thank you for being here for for a bit. And we are also joined, of course, by our podcast compañera, Stacy Lindas. Good evening, Stacy. How are you? I'm all right. How are you guys? Sorry, I'm late. I had some uh, technical difficulty where all of the uh, adapters were not in the right spot. So I they were not adapting my... as they needed to be. They were not. <laughs> no, USB C, USB A does not work well. That's all right. You're no, it's now. all good. We're we're, uh, nice. we're rolling here. We we got to meet Batsheva, Tim. We 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 introduced and uh, we talked about the weather, of course, because it's not podcast BD if we don't talk about the weather. <laughs> I got a sunburn, guys. It was so nice outside. I was planning with um, some grade level colleagues because we were changing some things up, and I got a sunburn just from being out there for the time that we planned yesterday, and another hour after that. Not I also much. got sunburn yesterday. Yeah. From just just sitting outside, um, yeah, just for a little bit. I was Off not prepared with my sunblock. Man. Yeah. <laughs> I'm usually an SPF 70 girl, so I'm just like. <laughs> a AJ, did you get any sunburn? I don't burn. Hey, I get, I, I'm I don't, I don't, There you go. I don't, I don't burn. <laughs> Whatever. I'm Puerto Rican and I burn. still burn. <laughs> Well, I don't burn because I'm Italian, and even if I take my shirt off, I got the sweater, so I'm always protected. Uh, all right. Time. So anyway, we're here tonight. <laughs> Let's get the show on the road. Uh, <laughs> real quick, also a uh, a nice shout out to the people checking in on the chat. David, our guest from last week. Good evening. Al is here. Amy is here. Robert is here. Christine is here. So we are certainly Stephanie. getting ready. Stephanie, yes. Um, again, if you're checking in on Facebook, you know, leave a comment. We'll get it up on the screen. Uh, but certainly come over to podcastpd.com slash live and uh, we will kind of get going. So our topic tonight is the fact that we're living in a time where we can turn education upside down, flip that thing over and reverse it. I don't know. There's all sorts of puns and things we can say, but education is changing. We've been talking about it for over a month and, you know, here, here we are the beginning of May, you know, schools are being shut down. For the rest of the school year left and right i think we're all waiting here in new jersey for that announcement to come down mm -hmm. you know this week from uh from the governor um wait wait, wait. But, i heard he can only like close school for 30 days at a time is there any truth to that do we know that for sure i'm not sure about that not i think sure that's why that. we keep going so many days out and then it's like okay we'll check in in 30 days well when he when we see him by you know may 17th uh I think that next 30 day run should take us through the end of the year for most of us. Yeah. Yeah. But we're going to come out of this. You know, people keep saying that and I believe it. I, I hope everybody believes we're going to come out of this and uh, eventually we're going to go back to our school buildings and our, our places of work. But, you know, I, I guess we'll start with how could education be different? What are some of your ideas on how we can not jump back into what was comfortable and what we knew and how can we reshape education in the present and going forward? So I, I will kind of throw that out there and, you know, we'll see where we go. Um, I'm happy to address it. Uh, one of the things that I have noticed in talking to educators, and I've been talking to educators all over the U.S., Canada, at Canada, and um, all over the world. I have an episode uh, that I just released with educators all over the world. And one of the things that's really hopeful, I think, is that these incredible systematic changes that we've been advocating for, for for a long time are suddenly being addressed, like the value of grades, um, standardized testing, 
the importance of student-centered learning, uh, blended learning, you know, all of these things that we've been talking about and, you know, people who really care about ed education have been like talking about these big issues. And then it turns out that this horrible thing that's happened actually is shining this amazing spotlight on all of these things and, and helping us to re-examine them. And hopefully, you know, when we go back someday, um, that we will have addressed these issues. And so um, for me, it's the one positive that's, you know, that and maybe the climate is getting a little better. Um, those are the only, you know, those are the positives for me. And I'm really trying to hold on to that. And um, an educator said before, if we go back into the classrooms, not having changed and grown, then we've done something wrong. So I'm hopeful that this is a really great time. These conversations are happening now. So, yeah. Time to overthrow education. <laughs> <laughs> I see what you did there. Yeah. <laughs> I completely agree. I think yeah, I think we're at a watershed moment for sure. And I love Amy's comment there about the just the learning that has happened professionally is really, really exciting. I mean, on the one hand, yeah, we have a lot of educators who are stressed and feeling anxious and, and, you know, maxing out their hours. We've heard those stories, but I think within that, there's also been a ton of growth. Um, one of my favorite anecdotes actually so far, uh, I heard on the Make Learning Magical podcast with Tish Richmond, her husband, Russ, was a pottery teacher and completely zero tech. You know, he's a long time pottery teacher. I think he was 20 years in that room or something like that. And of course this crisis is for, uh, forcing him, pushing him into Google Classroom and Flipgrid. And now he's, you know, finding new ways to share learning horizontally. You know, it's not just a vertical teacher student relationship. Now it's horizontal sharing. And he's also thinking about, okay, now I can actually film tutorials and post them and, and use them as asynchronous resources and, and reuse them in the future. And um, so he was saying on that podcast, like his practice has been completely changed, permanently changed. Wow. And that, that just excites me so much. Yeah. So I think over the last couple of weeks here, we've been kind of focusing on a bunch of different ideas. And, and I think everybody's on the same page. Like we are obviously we are the ones who are on the front line and we're the ones who are kind of pushing this because it's our belief that this is always what's going to work, whether it is blended learning, whether it is the increase of technology in our classrooms. And, I, and I'm glad it's going to happen. It's too bad. This is the situation that we're facing that's going to make it happen. But I think we need the people out there to really use their voices and really show that this is really going to take off. You know, we can't just say, oh, it worked for, for remote learning. It's not going to work when we get back in the classroom. So we have to have these people who who speak up, like whether they're leaders, whether they're teacher leaders, whatever the case may be. Our colleagues really need to be the ones who kind of embrace this and, and continue to push this out there and just keep showing that this is going to change. This is going to work for our students. Maybe not so much technology, because I know the screen time, screen time for me is definitely getting to me. <laughs> but but I, I think the practice, it really is going to be a positive change going forward. I think all in all, people are just kind of leveling up. Like they're bringing, they're bringing some unused PD into their into their day to day. You know, like I know as a former tech coach, like it was my job to train all of the middle school teachers and high school teachers and some of the fifth and fourth grade teachers how to use technology. And it's just nice to know that they're putting some of it into practice. It may not have been when I trained them how to do it. Um, or, you know, we talked about and had those conversations about how to integrate technology in a meaningful way, but they're doing it now. And I think better late than never, mm -hmm. um, you know, and one of the things that I think I'm really grateful for, um, here in New Jersey, we don't have to, I, you guys know, we don't have to do, um, our end of the year evaluations. We're not getting evaluated this year. Um, I don't have to do a write up like I normally do, but we're encouraged to reflect on what these last you know, a few weeks have been for us and what the experience at home and remote learning has taught us and what we can do to bring that new learning into the classroom for next year when we return. And like, I'm really looking forward to reflecting on w where I've, I've grown um, and where my kids have grown, especially in this, in this like new world, right? 
Yeah, I love that, Stacey. I was reading a blog post this afternoon that had sort of contained the idea of don't waste this pandemic, you know, and I, I know we don't want to shit on people <laughs> because some people really are just trying to survive right now and, and they're legitimately at a, at a tough place. But I think as much as we have that capacity right now to reflect on our practice, like some of these insights are super valuable and we don't want to lose them. I want to... I. David mentioned something in the chat about the inequity about technology. And I think that that's another thing uh, when I mentioned my list of things we're looking at, I think that's another thing that we have to really look at in this country is we all knew that there was such a huge inequity in education and there were so many problems, but this really shined a light on how serious the issue is. And so I'm really hoping that that issue is addressed, you know, that, that we continue to address that and try to figure out how to fix that because that's a, you know, it's a huge, huge problem. And I don't think, unfortunately, um, I don't think this is an anomaly that this is happening right now. I, I don't know if we're gonna go back to school in the fall. And if we do go back into the school in the fall, we may end up having to, you know, I hope that I'm wrong. I've never hoped more to be wrong, but we may end up having to do this again. So we really need to learn the lessons on how to do this right uh, because, you know, and to make this work. And I do really appreciate there are teachers um, like, you know, Stacy mentioned that I'm blown away by these traditional, traditional teachers suddenly learning technology and craving to learn it. I've been mm -hmm. hired as a consultant for schools that I would have died to get into to try to get them to change. And now they're coming to me and saying, you know, can you train our faculty on how to do this, that, or the other thing? And I'm, you know, so like, I'm really thrilled to see that they're stepping it up, these educators. And it's not easy. Mm -hmm. And I think this shifts the conversation when we think about like technology going into this point, it wasn't so much for the one-to-one -one initiatives that districts were, were rolling out. Everybody was prepared, at least here in New Jersey, I could speak for that. School districts were saying, we have technology. And the technology was mainly for the classroom and for the, the, the park exam. That's what technology was. Now we can finally say to a lot of these schools that we have technology that we can give to our students to let them create and let them think differently. And, and I hope that that becomes a shift. I know, as, as mentioned by Dave, I know the inequity is there and then hopefully that can be changed. Hopefully the state will put something in place, uh, whatever state you're at, hopefully something will be put in place where everybody can benefit from this. You know, if some grants are out there, maybe some big companies can do some more, but now we can stop focusing on just the state exams and now we can start focusing on getting these devices into students' hands to make their learning come to life. Mm -hmm. I think that's the emphasis. That's the shift. It's it's less about consumption and less about test taking and more about creation and having them really flex their muscles when it comes to being being responsible for their own learning, taking their own initiative. Like I think my kids have really learned these past seven weeks what it means to learn on your own because so much of what they're doing is really independent. Um, you know, I teach fifth grade, so I, I'm fortunate enough that hopefully my kids are not, and by kids, I mean my students, um, that they're not necessarily relying on their parents for all of the answers. Um, and, you know, I know from our day to day that they are pretty independent, but I see that during this time, like the questions come fast and furious. And I think that if they took just a few seconds to reread a few things, I tell them all the time, read it out loud there's something magical that happens when you read something to yourself out loud. There's just like all, all of a sudden the light bulbs go on and all the gears click into place. And there's like this massive comprehension that takes place that just didn't take place when you're reading in your head. But, um, you know, I really feel that like if they've learned anything, they've learned how to plan, they've learned how to create and they've learned how to learn independently. And critically think because that's part of the reading, yes. Stacey. And that's one of Chris's big things for his classroom. And I know he he uh, wants his kids to, to really focus on that as high school kids. Yeah. Stacey, I, I agree with your comments that I think we've seen the last of snow days. No more snow days. <laughs> or, or if there is a snow day, it'll just be learning as usual. It should be really interesting to see what happens. Mm -hmm. We didn't have a snow day this year, so I feel like all of our snow days were pretty much just thrown into the middle of the year, and it's called coronavirus. 
Right. Yeah, when you live in Los Angeles, you don't have snow days. But um, <laughs> I did blood. teach on the East Coast for a few years. And I got to tell you, as much as those kids were praying for snow, the teachers were praying even harder. <laughs> <laughs> I loved those sure. snow days. <laughs> sure. Sure. Every now and now, again. Every now, speaking of fast and furious, uh, we do have another panelist getting ready to come in. And I hope, Batsheva and Tim, you are not insulted. But this is our first podcast PD guest where... I've got a theme song ready to go for this next person. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not what you're all thinking, but I'm going to bring him up on screen into the broadcast. We're going to welcome in, we're going to welcome in Jake Miller. And he, he, here we go. Jake Miller from Educational Duct Tape. Duct Tape. Woo. You can repair anything with duct tape. But, uh, so I've been waiting the many days there. to play that. <laughs> so I went out and found it. Nice. Um, yeah, that's what we are here with uh, days. Jake days Miller as day. well. Jake, <laughs> how you doing? I'm doing great. It's good to see all you guys. These are three of my favorite or four of my favorite podcasts are represented here between uh, the House of Ed Tech and Podcast PD and Teachers on Fire and Botsheva's show. This is really cool having you guys all in here and, and being able to join in with you guys. We are very happy to have you, Jake. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. glad to join. And, and real quick, if you missed it, Jake is the host of the Educational Duct Tape Podcast. Make sure if you're not subscribed, you are missing out on one freaking fantastic <laughs> podcast. And I say that as one who makes a freaking fantastic podcast. <laughs> Two of them. Uh, so make sure. And no sure. You make several. <laughs> several, that's true. <laughs> make Jake sure you, you head over to jakemiller.net slash edu duct tape, and that's Duct tape with a CT, not a quack quack K because not I paid. Quack, okay, yep. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. I appreciate it, man. Jake, I was so sad to hear you're taking a bit of a break. I know it's just temporary, though, right? Yeah, just temporary. I like it's. It's funny. Like you guys are probably mostly in the same situation I'm in, where like the kids are at home with me now, and the wife's at home with me now, and it's like I've lost two or three hours of work out of every single day, and I'm like something. Like I've got to let something go for a little while. That's really hard for like most educators, like we're all kind of like overachievers and to be able to say like, so I've got it. There's, there's gotta be something I stopped doing. And I was like, it's gotta be the podcaster right now. So yeah, a little break. I, I kind of like last Wednesday morning, actually Tuesday night at midnight when I'm normally cranking out my Wednesday morning episode, I'm like, I don't know what to do with myself right now. I guess I'm gonna go to bed. <laughs> Yeah, you guys, I'm sure you guys know the feeling of that, right? That that rush oh, to yeah. get that episode out, right? Uh, yeah, I just did it right before I signed on here. <laughs> <laughs> we tell, <laughs> we tell Chris to go to bed all the time. Like, Chris, you cannot be up until one or two and in the morning. I don't it's listen. I mean, realistic. the episode I released today, I recorded today. Because yeah. I sat down last night. I was like, you know what? I'm going to go to sleep. So I, I do listen sometimes, Stacey. Kudos right. to you. <laughs> I'm impressed. Nice, nice. Yep. Hey guys, did you see I wore a shirt so that you knew who I was? Oh, I like nice. the Jake. <laughs> the Jake, yeah, as, as a as a Clevelander, nearby Clevelander, I've got to represent the former name of Progressive Field up in Cleveland, Jacobs Field. So I got the Jake on my shirt. I like it. Now, the reality is, everybody still calls it the Jake, right? That's the truth. Yep, it's still the Jake. <laughs> Beautiful stadium too. I was there. Oh yeah, I love that one. And I I am missing it right now. We normally would have oh. would have headed up for a May game by this time to see uh, Frankie Lindor play and this, yeah, this is just one of the many things that we're missing right now, right? right. Future Yankee Frankie Lindor, correct. Nice. Right, he, he probably is. And you know what? <laughs> if this takes too much longer, he's never going to be in a Cleveland Indian again. He's just going to go straight to being a Yankee. <laughs> hey, Jake, you're not the only guest that I just saw. I just saw a little Bianco on there. Yeah, I saw a little Bianco pop in there as well. Yep. That Where'd was, he go? That was D. He's heading up to bed. I got, I got Rye over here. Rye, you want to come say hi real quick? All right. He's not. No. <laughs> well, Daniel's on the screen for a hot second. My kids are in bed. They've been that way for the last hour and a half. So mine are downstairs playing video games, which they've probably been doing for the past eight hours. <laughs> I think I yep. no, we saw them for dinner. My son is coding video games because that's pretty much what he does all day. Nice. <laughs> he's like a 14 year old. I don't know. He's amazing. That's awesome. <laughs> that's awesome. That's Let him do his thing. I, you know. <laughs> yep. So, Jake, our current topic tonight is how can we turn education upside down and move education forward? Mm -hmm. How would you change education coming out of current events? 
you know what I, what I've been really excited about, like the silver lining I'm trying to look at as an educator through this situation, like this is this is some crummy stuff, but the silver lining I'm trying to find is that I'm starting to see educators finally have not not all educators, but a lot of educators finally have a reason to integrate the technology. Like before it was like we were telling them, hey, you should use Google Classroom. Hey, you should start using collaborative Google Slides. Hey, you should try out Pear Deck. Hey, you should do this. And they're like, no, nah, you know, I don't, I don't really want to. And they didn't have a reason, right? And now they've got a reason and they're like, they're like all aboard the train, right? So I think that's the most exciting thing to see happening is these educators that were a little bit tech adverse and were, um, you know, not as excited about using technology in the classroom. Now they're buying in because they see a reason. So I think what we need to do as leaders in education and leaders in educational technology is to help them say, you know, in the future, when we're back in our classrooms, okay, now what's your reason? Why, why are you going to continue using this technology in the classroom? Like, you're, you're not going to be in this situation where it's the, this distance learning or remote learning any, anymore. Like, what is the reason that you're going to keep leveraging these things in the classroom? And I think, I think if we do it right, we could see some exciting things happen for learners. And this is like that math question. When am I ever going to use this? Right. And now mm -hmm. teachers are finally saying, oh, I really should have paid attention more in that PD or I should have went above and beyond to, to really learn this, this new, this new trick and this new tool they've been talking about for so long. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you well, know, it goes back to what you say all the time too, AJ, with like Simon Sinek, and it starts with why. And, yeah. you know, I just hope that their why remains relevant after all of this and that they that they see the value, that they see the engagement, you know, even if it's remotely, that they see that their kids are producing in a way that they weren't producing back in February and early March. Yeah. Um, just, and that it's new. It continues to be about the buy in. So, you know, I, I, I hate, again, I hate to say that this, this pandemic is what's going to help people buy in, but. Really, this should be the buy-in that people that kind of get excited, ex people excited for where they're going to go going forward. Yeah, I, also, I, I think it's kind of exposing some of the problems we've had with like professional development, especially relating to technology. In that, like we, we know the work of of Dan Pink with Drive and, and the three main things that motivate us. And in a lot of situations, we haven't been giving that to teachers. Like we haven't been giving them autonomy over what they learn to do. Like yeah, they could be like us and go out and listen to a billion podcasts and and be on Twitter all the time. But in their actual classrooms and in their rooms and in their faculty meetings, we're not giving them choice. They're lacking that autonomy. They don't see a chance to get mastery. And some of them don't even see a purpose in using the technology. And now all of a sudden they've kind of got all three, right? Like every, every time they get on Zoom with their students, they've got a chance to get closer to mastering using that. And every time they have like, well, I wish I could connect with these students. They've got a, a purpose to use. And then they've got this autonomy of saying, well, I'm, I'm not going to do Zoom. I'm going to do Loom or I'm going to do this. Or I'm going to do that. And so now we're giving them all three of those things. So if we can continue to help them, and you're, you're absolutely right, AJ, we've, we've got to help them see a why that's relevant. Like the why can't just be grading a multiple choice test or whatever it might be, or going paperless it's got got to have some benefit that resonates with the students but ultimately if it resonates with them and gives them that autonomy then that's that's going to be huge it's going to be exciting to see the other thing that i uh, think is really interesting and when you said about grading the test that made me think of this is that um, aside from the technology part, just in terms of uh, the way we teach and more importantly, the way we assess, I find that um, what I'm, what schools want to know now is tests and quizzes, which I've always been against. I'm always huge on authentic and creative assessments. Mm -hmm. And I've been teaching it for so many years. And then I feel like sometimes I'm teaching these workshops and stuff and some people are listening and most of them are still like gonna go right back to their tests and quizzes. But now all of these schools are saying, we can't do tests and quizzes anymore in the way that we used to because it doesn't make any sense with remote learning. Uh, and I, and you know, inside I'm thinking, well, it didn't actually make any sense anyway, but that's another story. But <laughs> they've been really open to hearing about all of these other ways, some that involve tech, some that are very light on tech, some of that are heavy on tech, but that really involve uh, great authentic and creative ways of assessing their students, both the formative and the summative. And so um, it's, to me, that is like, finally, you know, they're really listening. And so, and I know that when they see the results of this, that by the time we do get back into the classrooms, I really feel like that's going to be a change and and they're not going to go back to those tests anymore because they've already seen how exciting it is 
to think of these other kinds of assessments and <clears throat> to see the students like come alive when they do these kinds of assessments and like, oh, I didn't even know that kid knew that thing. Wow, that's so you know, cool. <laughs> You know, one, speaking of assessment and peer assessment, one tool that I, I feel like I'm late to the party on Padlet. So I, I love I, Padlet. I, oh my gosh, it's oh such a good God. tool. And I, I haven't been using it much yeah. in my practice. I, I, I mean, I've got a lot of other tools, but yeah. um, I, I've been using Padlet lately. And what a fun way for kids to share writing or share mm -hmm. images of artwork or uh, like Padlet even supports video. So. Right. It's like visually, I mean, I know Flipgrid is wonderful and Jake, you do a great Love job it. on your show talking about everything Flipgrid can do. Right. But um, man, I have not been using Padlet and I feel like when I get back to quote normal school, Padlet's going to be in my practice. So I just love like, I think we have to hang on to those those next levels. You know, we have to keep them going because the whole, the whole, I think one of the ways that K-12 education is evolving right now is we have to do more horizontal sharing. Right, like Google Google Classroom is a great LMS, but it's vertical, right? It's teacher to student, student uh, student to teacher. Uh, those comments just go vertically, and so we have to find other tools to really share horizontally, so kids can learn from each other. That's yeah. that's so important right now. So Tim, I'm going to throw you on the spot. You just put it out there. What's something you in September? What are you going to do to help that? Yeah, well, I mean, Padlet to start for mm -hmm. sure, uh, Flipgrid. So my school uses Seesaw. And another thing, another example of what I'm talking about is I have not been using the Seesaw blog very mm -hmm. much or very often. So students post a lot and we have a little bit of authentic audience because their their teacher, or their parents can see it and the EA can see it, I can see it, but their peers are not really seeing their work. And so a couple of weeks into this thing, I was like, you know what, everything we post on Seesaw, unless it's of a personal nature or something that might, you know, endanger students or something, let's just push it out to the blog because we need to build community. We need visibility right now. Yep. And you find that to be a successful thing at the middle school with Seesaw? I knew it was uh, very elementary based. So I'm, that's yeah, why I'm yeah. asking. Yeah, yeah. Our, I mean, we've we've got a K to eight right now. We don't use it in our high school, but yeah, it works really well. I mean, our, our kids don't know any different. They they've just always been on Seesaw, and yeah, it it works great. And, and something else that I love about Seesaw that I want to use more is the audio feedback feature. I don't know if you guys are on Seesaw, but it does allow that quick click. Teacher leaves a voice recording. Uh, in terms of feedback, I've done it a couple of times, but I need to do it more. Just another way to humanize that uh, that feedback, right? So, you know, I, I can't wait till Google Classroom embeds that sort of a feature, but that would be yeah, great. Yeah. Seesaw is robust. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. One, one thing yeah, I really yeah. like about Seesaw, Tim, one, one reason it's really one of my favorites is like it's got the elements that Google Classroom has where it's that like top down or for the, the wording you used for it. It, do, it does have like teacher assigned, mm -hmm. students do, students submit, but yeah. it's also got like sides in and bottom up where like the kids are right. sharing, the kids are saying like, this is something I want everybody to see, or this is something I want my teacher to see or my parents to see. And it does have that. It has that like student ownership piece that that is often lacking in our schools and that they're getting a chance to kind of in a lot of classrooms, quote unquote classrooms uh, right now, they're getting a chance to do because because they're getting a chance to kind of think outside of the box with the way they do their schoolwork. Mm. And, and I know at the elementary level, it also um, facilitates that parent communication piece no, totally, that I think yeah. like we are totally missing right now. You know, parents yeah. aren't having conferences and that's like a whole new thing. My kids are moving on to the middle school. So there's that like anxiety and they're missing out on all of those end of the year activities. And, you know, we're currently trying to think about that, but just staying in contact, not only with your students, but with your families um, is really meaningful. We and actually did. Um... So I was just gonna say at my son's school, we did, he's in high school and we did parent teacher zoom conferences and, and the students. So my son was like, it was just the teacher, me and my son with you know with each of his teachers in a zoom room it was so much better and they were they were so much more productive they were so much better than us you know schlepping to the school and having to run around to see all the teachers in a mm -hmm. short amount of time i mean it was like a, it was so intimate and it was such a good experience that i think the school is considering switching to that permanently wow that that way of doing it yeah which i thought was like you know, something you wouldn't have thought of, but it was, it was actually really cool. So in that sense, I did feel actually more in touch with the teachers than I normally do. 
If yeah, I was, was going to build on that, I would say, you know, at least in my school, we have, uh, even at the high school, we have like afternoon conferences and then we have the evening conferences. And I don't think any teacher alive would raise their hand and say, I love staying at school till eight o'clock at night for parent teacher <laughs> conferences. But I could see the afternoon session remaining, you know, parents, you can come to school, go to the right. classroom, do that whole bit. But then the evening sessions, teachers go home and do the, go do conferences from your house, mm -hmm, do mm -hmm. your little remote conference setup, you know, get your green screen, do your background and have parents schedule you and do it remotely. Yeah. As, as long, as you, keep, as long my... as you keep those interviews moving. <laughs> Sorry, <Yeah. thank> you. <laughs> right. And that's it. Like, I don't know. Um, I wonder where the cutoff is for that. Right. Like I've, mm -hmm. I've not attended a conference this year for my boys because they're in the middle school and high school. And I feel like unless they're at risk, which I know Amy talked about it on the side conversation. Um, like, what do we do for those, those kids who are considered at risk, but my kids are not considered at risk. And, um, so I haven't had a need for those conferences and I don't want to take those slots from parents who truly need them. Um, but I wonder, you know, at least in my school, the expectation um, throughout the community is that everyone kind of meets with the teacher, not only for back to school night, but also for at least that first conference, if not to follow up whether or not the teacher is requesting the conference or not, or the child is at risk. So I wonder where, where is that cutoff where like, would I be able to do that as a fifth grade teacher with my families and, and have a, um, a virtual conference. I had a virtual IEP meeting and that was, that was really fantastic. I mean, that was, it was, it just seems so much faster. And, <laughs> and like you're saying, Tim, like it was just like, you know, you really follow that schedule. And I feel like there's not a lot of the posturing because everyone right. feels that time is of the essence, right? And like we are confined to a schedule, and the next person is not going to be waiting out so outside outside the door, and you know, be lenient and and kind. Um, you know, it's like, well, why weren't you on my Zoom call at ten fifteen when we scheduled it? <laughs> and uh, Amy in the chat would also like to see this idea of virtual meetings extend beyond parent teacher conferences, and you know, PTA meetings, stream them, board of education meetings, stream them. Those yes, well, and they're doing that in my town too. Mm -hmm. They're they're streaming all of the board of ed meetings. I've yet to attend one. I attended more board of ed meetings when they were live, and I like had to drive myself to the school than I have since they've been virtual. But we'll see. I'll try to make it. Um, but I like that idea. There's no reason, that, even if for um, you know, in that instance, there's no reason you can't take that practice and make it a best practice for those people who can't attend mm -hmm. board of ed meetings, PTA meetings. They should be recorded. They should. If you want community like if you really want to reach all stakeholders then you should be recording them so that all stakeholders can participate in a way that's convenient for them yeah i, I feel like what moving... that if you want to stream it live go check out the latest episode of house of ed tech where i tell you how you can stream any school event chris slash 156 cheap <laughs> well i was going to say i feel like we're moving into a bit of an mo of just record everything Right. I mean, asynchronous, mm -hmm. asynchronous, everything, not everything has value and, and we can't record student faces for privacy reasons. But, you know, so much of what we do in is, in a sense, inefficient in the normal environment. Right. Because we're saying the same things over and over or we're re repeating content. Um, I'll give you a quick example. When I started this thing, I was making daily update videos for my students, parents every night, the day before. Uh, you know, the day of lessons and I was recording those and then sending them out. And then at some point, like just last week, I realized, okay, why don't I just record myself talking to my students live on Google meet that morning. And then I'll send that to the parents and then I'm not doing it twice. You know what I mean? So just looking for efficiencies like that to me is like a real eye opener as well. Yeah, some of my world language teachers would call that working smarter, not harder. And just yeah. kind of like really using the technology and leveraging it in a way that really minimizes the amount of work that you're doing so that it's not being duplicated or it, there's not a lot of redundancy. Right. Yeah, I love that. I just threw this question out into the chat and I'll throw it out to everybody here uh, because it just came up. Do you think that current events could lead to changes in FERPA and COPA and what we can and can't do with students around technology? Oh man, I hope so. Wow. It's yeah. I mean, another thing that needs to be re-examined. Um, like it, it has to be because as situations change, everything has to be re-examined really. 
<laughs> how many how many years of red tape do you think it'll take to get those two things changed over though? <laughs> A really long time. Like I look at like our um like our our senior pre-service teachers are no longer allowed to have their student teaching opportunities in my district because of the recording requirements that they have for certification. Mm. Oh, AJ, wow. I see your face, but that's, I mean, we, so we don't have anyone past junior year in our district right. because the teachers have to record themselves teaching. And then what does that do? And, you know, in violating kids' rights and, you know, how does it change learning in the classroom? And I talked to, um, one of my one of my colleagues this year, she's a brand new teacher. She's like, even last year when she was doing her recording, certain kids had to sit out. And like, how uncomfortable is that for that kid, mm -hmm. even who is not allowed to be part of that? Mm -hmm. It's not that they were excluded from the learning, but they were not part of that meeting area time. And like, then they're other. And like, that's just a whole new can of worms that I don't know. There's a lot of red tape, Jake. I think mm -hmm. that's the answer to your question. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah a lot. <laughs> Sharpen your scissors, everybody. Right. <laughs> <laughs> A I think Amy there's the a lot of mind. Go What's ahead, that, Tim? Well, Amy in the chat was just saying, uh, just minimize the kids' faces on Zoom when you are doing your lesson when sharing your screen. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think it's also yeah. a shift in mindset, right? Like, like, I remember before my kids were school age, I was like, oh, my kids will never be allowed to be, like, in local press or on the website or whatever. And I was like, why? Like, what is any different from me posting them on Facebook as children? than them their school you know lauding their acc accolades and and kind of saying like hey these kids are rock stars you know mm. and of course so it's just a shift in mindset the, christine makes the great point the kids don't turn their cameras on anyway <laughs> yeah most of mine do not most of mine do not and i was going to say i actually don't teach synchronously right now at all i just have a sort of a, a daily morning circle check-in yeah. Um, and, and talk about announcements plan for the day and then off they go. And then I'm sort of in a, a support role just because kids are on different schedules. Right. So yeah, I, I actually have a ton of sympathy for, for schools that I hear that are following a usual timetable. I think that is really tough. Wow. But what if, a lot of pressure on the families at home too. Yeah. Like, oh, you tons. know, yeah. depending on what your, what your digital situation is, your device situation, what parent situations are like, I don't know what your, what your own children are like, but I know Chris and AJ have, young school age children and my kids are older so they're very independent i couldn't imagine yeah. having to sit down and teach second grade oh. math or like talk about high frequency words with a first grader no and yeah, and take care of my 24 my fifth graders two digit numbers by stacking them and we talked about carrying the one and you don't carry uh, anywhere <laughs> oh we carry <laughs> i was rocking second grade math like it was 1995 where are you carrying it to the tennis. Math <laughs> is math. You're regrouping. <laughs> Whatever. I don't stop it. I'm not I, I taught him I taught him order of operations. We talked but about with with PEMDAS or GEMDAS? Um I use apples and oranges and I <laughs> we're just going over adding. Okay. You can add numbers in any order you want. See, even so Stephanie says it. it's regrouping. Thank you, Stephanie. I, I just want to say that I actually got very lucky because my son is in high school and among other things, I teach high school English. So he, he did need help with um, writing an essay. And like, I was like, come to the rescue. I'm here. I can, this I can do. <laughs> Don't ask me about your honors geometry class or your biology class, but this I can help you with. <laughs> you're probably driving him crazy, but you're loving it. <laughs> right. No, I it. no, I think he actually really appreciated it. Cause I have like this really wacky method for writing an essay that I call the margarita of um, essay writing. <laughs> and um, it's, like a proven success. And so he, I think he appreciated my margarita of writing, of good writing. I would I appreciate a margarita just, as well. Just to be clear, I did not, <laughs> I did not let him drink a margarita oh, so that his God. writing would be good. I just want to clarify that. <laughs> That's not how that works. <laughs> Too funny. <laughs> This whole situation has definitely been a uh, a drain, both mentally and physically. And you know, I, 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 we are working with our first grader. We are also working with a five year old and a fifteen month old. And you have my schedule, my wife's schedule, doing her teaching, and every 
every minute something else is going on, whether I'm on a video call or some kind of meeting or it's just, it's been totally How, How's the everyday math tiresome. going with the 15 month old? She's doing wonderfully. She's well, the good thing is you have a math educator using, at home with you. Yeah, that's she not can even, talk about regrouping and gem like, I'm ignoring the math conversation because I <laughs> I just don't want to talk about math. So uh, <laughs> I, I wanted to bring up something else. Uh but Sheva, Amy, yeah. yeah, go ahead, Chris. I was gonna say Amy, Amy wants to know what is what's a margarita essay writing? Tell us more. I was wondering the same thing. Cinco de Mayo's on Tuesday. I might write one of them. Perfect, right? No, so actually I drew a diagram. I'm frantically looking for it. I drew it for my son. Let me see if I can find my margarita (laughs) diagram here somewhere. Where is it? Um, Basically, it's just like what makes here. I'll, I'll draw it really fast on the back of this. Okay, so what makes a great margarita like what's the most important part of uh, i can't draw by the way but you'll you'll understand and i saw something about salt on the rim and salt on the rim is actually really important um definitely i'm trying to draw this really fast and it's going to be really even more awful than my normally awful but you'll get the drift i think okay so here's how it goes oh this is the worst okay can you all whoops let me see can you all see that yes Okay, so the margarita is the most important part. So what part of the essay would that be? Everybody, what's the most important part of your essay? It's your thesis, oh, right? That is pretty important. Okay. It? That's pretty important, right? And But now you got to see, I can't get it. Oh, there we go. Okay, that's <laughs> just so you know, that's supposed to be an umbrella and, like a, the umbrella. Um, and a lime. And a lime or some fruity, yummy thing. Like it could be a strawberry if it's a strawberry margarita. And so what would that be? That's the thing that entices you in the beginning, right? That's the hook. That's the hook, right? And the salt, which is what you drink, like you take that on your way to the margarita is what? From your hook to your thesis are your transitions transitions. and your background and so forth, right? And then the thing that holds up the whole thing that supports the whole margarita. The details can't... and the evidence. The details and the evidence and the support. That's this part. And then the, I don't know, can you see the the thing on the, the bottom base. is the base, the right? Base. So that's the conclusion, right? Because it, it brings it all together. But the thing about it is that if you see the margarita class, I didn't really make it right because I made it kind of more round. I made it more like a wine glass because I guess. You really can't mess up a margarita. But imagine it. So it goes from general to specific, right? Like you Mm -hmm. start out your introduction and then you get really specific. But when you get to your conclusion, you start out. I can't see my pen. There we go. You start out specific and you get general. I love All right, Bacheva, in an upcoming episode, we need to have a commercial for the Cocktails in the Classroom professional course <laughs> totally. that we'll be offering. <laughs> He's looking title. for his salt shaker. I, That's I awesome. teach this to my middle school students, but my high school students all really loved it. And, um, and surprisingly, I did not get in trouble for teaching this. In fact, the students were, they all learned like how to write a really good essay, um, keeping that in mind. They were like, oh, I finally get the structure. Thank you. So, and now they'll think of me in college when they're drinking margaritas, I suppose. <laughs> or on Friday if their parents let them. Right, or whatever. <laughs> nice. Anybody else got any diagrams you want to bring to the table? <laughs> <laughs> I love Amy's comment. <laughs> Thank That's you, Amy. Great. Yep. She said, if you taught me this in high school, I would have learned essay writing much faster. And they do. <laughs> it's amazing. Oh, hey, my it's goodness. never too late to learn how to write a great essay. That's right. <laughs> or to drink a good margarita. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> so that's so awesome. I mean, we, we have the duct tape metaphor. Now we have the margarita metaphor. I don't think I can win in this competition. <laughs> <laughs> Duct tape, margarita. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I did a, I have to say in the nineties, okay, I'm totally dating myself, but in the late nineties, one of my don't worry about years, in the nineties, I dated myself too. <laughs> That's not what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <clears throat> I'm blushing. You can't tell, but I am. Um, so in the late 90s, I was uh, 
teaching and I actually did, uh, I didn't really know the lingo or anything about like, you know, creative assessments or anything like that. I just kind of did it. And I just was like, well, it's way more interesting for me. So I did a duct tape challenge because I had some students who were obsessed. And this is like the late nineties. There was a kid who made an entire pair of pants out of duct tape. And I was like, okay, I got to give a duct tape now challenge. We're and I did. And uh, it was a blast. It was so much fun. Huh. I think Jake, duct while you're on pants. hiatus, you just need to like throw that out there. Like, duct what are pants. you doing with your duct tape? Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Not making Show pants. me your duct tape fashion. <laughs> duct tape design challenges. Here we go. Yep. Well, right now I there only have go. to wear sweatpants anyhow, so I don't need duct right. tape pants. <laughs> you could say you're wearing duct tape pants. Nobody would know. I could be too. Who knows? <laughs> Every we all could be. I'm just thinking if they're pants, I hope there's like a lining in them. Because right. I'm, like seeing a lot of like hair oh. patches on male right. legs and <laughs> Their pants and know. hair removal uh, so, kits all together. Some unintentional manscaping there. <laughs> I feel like none of that has to do anything with what we were talking oh, about. <laughs> this is where education's going after this. Apparently, this is the yeah. let's turn education upside down with duct tape pants and margaritas, you guys. <laughs> we keep it real on podcast, PD. <laughs> <laughs> We are truly living up to the, you're going to have more fun with us as opposed to going to your faculty meeting or <laughs> hanging out on a PD day. Right. Uh, and you might learn something. Who knows? <laughs> I, I think most people walk away feeling something after <laughs> listening. <laughs> feeling something. Feeling something. <laughs> um, a lot of interesting comments in the chat. Um, I'm seeing some stuff about, you know, I think virtual prom. Prom wear out of duct tape. That's cool. <laughs> uh, Amy believes that alcohol is the best part of the margarita. <laughs> Factually correct. Uh, Chris, yeah. can I pose a question? Go ahead. So, um, you know, I, I put together this piece about nine ways that I think education will change as a result of this crisis. And one of them I'd love to hear from the high school teachers and that is, do you see sort of a permanent shift toward flexible schedules? Um, you know, every second Friday is a remote day or, or maybe one day a week or, or alternating days in some districts. Like, do you see remote learning sort of becoming a fixture where kids can have more self-directed time? So I, can, I would love to address that yeah, for two yeah. reasons. One, um, one of the people on the episode, I did an international episode with teachers from all over the world that I just released today. And one of them was talking about, uh, you know, we, we focus so much on agents, student agency, right? right? And of how they learn and what they learn, but now we're actually also doing when they learn, right? And so my school actually, um, Arte Preparatory Academy is actually considering all of those questions that you just asked, like, should we be restructuring our day? What does this look like? Is it possible for us? We're actually talking about now, um, it, we've been so successful at the remote learning that we're also talking about like, why why are we limiting ourselves to students from Los Angeles? Like mm -hmm. we could have students from all over the country joining us that, that need the kind of education that we do, um, which is so special. And so, I think that, you know, that's even a question that we could ask when and where, right? Is it yeah. going to limit even school districts that are, you know, public schools? Could yeah. someone learn from a different school district that, you know, without having to live in that area? Is that a question that we can ask? So, yeah, I think the distance learning options are going to be rich after this because schools are iterating so far forward compared to where they were that you know the remote learning environment is going to be better for it and now we're seeing the proof that like you said in your context i mean kids are killing it in some cases i mean something we haven't talked a whole lot about is that yes on the one hand students are, are missing the social dynamics and, and the community and that is so critical yeah. but on the other hand we're all hearing from students who sit, who are telling us wow i'm way more productive in my own space and, you know not every kid but right. some but for some kids it's like they don't have the social distractions of the classroom. There's no bells. It's just their instant noodles, their tea, their whatever, and they just go after it. And, 
you know, I've, I've got one son who fits probably both my boys really fit that description quite well. They just get it done. Yeah. And they're probably way more productive at home. Yeah. I, I've seen my younger one who um, my husband and I have talked about the fact that like when he went to middle school, it was like we were worried just a little bit because he wasn't the strongest academic student at the elementary level. But he's really he's really thrived this year. And we're seeing him get even better during this pandemic. Like he's up at 630. He is totally in charge of his day. He is starting his work. He's taking a look at what it is. He takes breaks when he needs to. He makes himself breakfast. He makes himself lunch. He's, you know, he's like, okay, I have to go out for PE now. I'm like, okay, where are you going? He's like, I'm going to go for a bike ride. I'm going to go, you know, I'm going to go for a walk, whatever. Um, do you want to go for a bike ride with me? Like, he's just like totally, totally in charge of his own learning. And um, it's been really, really nice because I think that those kids who you know, really don't have that autonomy have been given some, some room to kind of flex their muscles that way. Good. So how do, how do we get, off. how do we get educators to, to reflect on all of this, this stuff too? Because I think we're all like all educators are seeing like, man, I miss my kids, man, the kids miss us, man, the kids miss the connections. I can't mm -hmm. wait to get back into class, but how do we empower and like create the reflection in all across all of the educators where they come to those realizations of what you're saying there, Stacy, where it is really powerful to have some kind of control over your day, what you do, when you do it, your, your success, kind of like a mastery based kind of thing. Yet he, he still does need to get back into those situations where he's connecting with his classmates. But like, how do we, how do we get the educators to reflect and, and discover that so that this, so this truly is a pendulum shift, like, right, right. You think about before this all happened, we were way over here on the left and now we've had to swing way over to the right. And we want to make sure that we swing back to the middle, right? Where we, we keep some of this stuff and we keep some of what we used to have. So like, how do we create that, that opportunity for reflection? I think some of it starts at the top, right? Like, I think like one of the, like to Tim's question of, you know, can you see having a day where kids don't have to report to school and their day is virtual or they, it's a day of, of self-directed learning that's not a decision that the average educator can make on their own, mm. right? Like mm -hmm. I'm not even in charge of my own schedule and I'm a self-contained elementary school teacher. Like my kids don't go out. I don't have programming. Like, you know, I'm not resource anything. I'm not basic skills, anything. And I'm still told when I have to have reading and when I have to have math and, and when I have to teach all of my other content area. And that, that, you know, going back into the classroom this year, that was really new to me. Like I used to be in charge of that. So I could see, you know, in your hypothetical situation, Jake, where like I could say, okay, like if math is the first thing you want to do, then you focus on math. Here's what we're doing. And like, it, it goes back to like what AJ has really been talking about for years. And it's that blended situation. Um, and, you know, kids kind of create their, and design their own schedules. I don't know what that would look like in reality, but like I would sure be willing to give it a try if I had someone who was willing to let me do that. I, I'm going to be out soon because I promised my wife I'd be off at 6.30. But I, I will say that I, I I love what you're saying, Jake and Stacey. And, and I, that's, I think what we're looking at is, is some nice shades of hybrid, right? Where maybe there are some more drop-in times, some, some uh, actual, you know, physical drop-in times with teachers where kids can come by on that self-directed day and get that face-to-face -face help. I'm, I'm looking at Christine's comment. You know, that for some learners, face to face really is critical, right? Mm -hmm. And they need to be walked through it. But especially at the upper, upper, you know, years in high school, I think we have some really exciting options. It's really awesome. Hey, it was a pleasure to connect with all of you in real time. Some I have, some I have not before. So we'll have to connect yeah. again, Tim. Yeah, yeah looking forward to it. We'll get Tim, you back. real quick before you hop off, uh, yeah, let yeah. people know where they can connect with you further and how they can listen to your podcast. Yeah, it's teachers on fire everywhere is the is the short and simple answer. So thank you so much again, Chris. I love what you're doing. I mean, I'd love to chat with you uh, privately to hear all or maybe you'll list it in the in the YouTube show notes or whatever. Uh, just the names of the platforms and apps that you use to put this together. But it's a slick operation. I love. Hey, this is just another great product of this crisis. I think we're seeing more great uh, live streaming options for educators. So thank you so much, Chris and AJ and Stacy for all you do. And Batsheva and Jake, great to connect with you guys too. You too. 
Thanks for joining us. Take care. Later. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you, Tim. Um, while, while we're sad to see Tim go, that does officially open up the seat. So if you've been enjoying this conversation via the chat and you want to come on with us, go to podcastpd.com slash join and you'll get into the green room. There are no M&Ms. There are no snacks, <laughs> but we can get you on the air. So Maybe at your house, there's not. <laughs> <laughs> we have peanut butter cups here. I have Reese's Pieces, but they're in another room. Well, those hey. are both. Hey, Bacheva, will you do me a favor and pass those M&Ms down to Stacy, and then Stacy will pass them over to me? Yeah. <laughs> That'd be cool, Rudy. Went the wrong way. <laughs> yeah. Now, wh- while they're passing virtual <laughs> M&Ms, I do want to jump on what Jake said. and But I-, I think the bigger issue would be seat time. And so much of how we mm-hmm. measure students in school is – you know, the 180 days, let's say, and you know, how long is the school day and what's an official day? Is it a half day? Is it a full day? Snow day? This, I, I've, I forget where I picked it up. It's not an original thought, but if we're measuring seat time, we're measuring the wrong end of the learner. Mm-hmm. That's something I picked up <laughs> along the way. I, love and that. <laughs> I can't take credit. I just been using it for years. Um, but could there be, and should there, I think there should be more virtual learning days. I mean, if you want to break it down to dollars and cents, what school in say Wisconsin or in the the cold north of Canada wouldn't like to shut down and not have to heat a school building for four weeks and we'll just do remote learning, stay home, you know, there's cost saving measures there, you know? Um I, I don't know. What, what what are your thoughts on? I do have to say, I do have to say one of the issues with that, uh, in, depending on how old the kids are, is it you know, now we're kind of stuck because everybody's at home. And so the parents are also at home. Right. Parents are like, you know, on the front lines or first responders, whatever. But in a typical time, unless the parents also cannot get into work, that's really challenging for, you know, especially for such a huge amount of time. Um, well, that would be I mean, really challenging for parents. You do have people through this who have unfortunately lost jobs, but right. you've also seen a big shift in a lot of industries where a lot of corporations and companies are going to say, wait a second, we were still able to do what we do and we didn't have to have you come into our office space. Right. Do we need office space? Could we move a lot of our operations virtually? So could we, I mean, this is just, this is like big shifts in, right. in just life and culture. So certain industries, maybe more parents would be available at, at home for kids to be at home. I, I don't yeah. know. I'm I'm sort of, I mean, we talk about, yes, I miss my kids. I miss my job and going to school, but there's a big part of me that does not miss my 45 minute to an hour commute, hmm. you know, and I can do my job just as well sitting right here, live streaming to my kids. So hmm. I, I don't know. I think in those, in those younger classrooms where the, like the childcare and the, and the getting the, you know, the having the kids at school. So the parents can go to work thing. Like, I think that what we have to think about there is, okay, so we know, okay, so that's a non-negotiable kids have to be there from eight 30 to two 30 or whatever it is. Um, what, what have we learned from this experience about what that time should look like? You mm-hmm. know, does, does yeah. everybody, um, you know, experience the same lesson at the same time for the same amount of time. Right. And, and actually a lot of elementary school teachers are really good at this with their use of stations models and things like that, where there's a whole lot of things going on at one time where a kid who could, uh, process and access and learn information really quickly can move through it really quickly. And a kid who needs a little more time to process, it gets that time. But I think those are the kinds of things that we have to reflect on is what lessons have we learned through this? And I think that's a lesson that we've learned through it. One of the things that I would love for us to reflect on, and I don't, it may get overlooked with all the other issues that we're reflecting on, but um, this idea of subjects instead of, you know, cross-curricular kind of cross-subject integration, which I think would solve a huge amount of issues, but we're so used to like, now we're doing science and now we're doing math and now we're doing social studies or whatever. So I'm just wondering, like, that would be such a great thing for us to really look at. Do we need to be teaching that way with all these, you know, separate subjects? I mean, I would obviously say, no, we don't need to do that. We could integrate it all. And I think it would be more successful. Um, And then that could give so much more autonomy to our students and our teachers in terms of, you know, how they're teaching the material. Right. 
We absolutely do what we do because of logistics, right? Like, like we're, we're totally like a slave to the logistics of, of what needs to happen during the school day. But you're right, Pacheva, and we, we need to start thinking about um, – are these are these logistics helping you know supporting us doing what we want to do or which is what we always have done you know like are right. they, are we doing the right things right oh the, the, you mean the worst idea in education that's the way we've always done it right yeah <laughs> right <laughs> and and i mean you know that there are people looking forward to getting back to doing things the way they've always done it well this is what i say to that i call it the rotary phone of education so if you had <laughs> If you, right, we used to use, rot well, I don't know about you all, but I used to have a rotary phone. Do you, do you all know what a rotary phone is? <laughs> yes. think, okay. Yes. So we used to have a rotary phone and it was plugged into the wall at my cord and it was great. And we used it all the time and it was totally fine and it totally worked. But if you told me now, we're going to take away your smartphone and you're going to go back to a mo rotary phone because it worked just fine when you were a kid. So it must be just fine now. You would say, I don't know anybody on the planet who would, well, I shouldn't say anybody on the planet. My mom, maybe. But most people would not say, I, I will gladly give up my smartphone because the rotary phone was good enough for us. So it must be good enough, you know. For now, it's not right. We have smartphones now, and now we can see something else. We see a whole different paradigm of what a phone even is, and who's going to want to give that up now? So I feel like it's the same thing with education. Like, why would we want to go back to a rotary education when we know that there's so much better out there? Yeah, and that, and that's a hidden bonus that we're seeing right now, right? Where we're being to to run with your your um your metaphor there is is we're being like we're forcing everybody to go from their rotary phone to a smartphone. Right. Now right. they're experiencing it, and now they're not going to want to go back. They're going to see some things that they miss. Like like there are other metaphors we could use that like yeah we we did prefer it that way. We did right. prefer to see see our students face to face. But there there are some lessons that now by experiencing both the before and the after, we can now visualize this new path forward that kind of is a combination of the two right and that's been education for all of time i'm i'm sure at some point teachers are like i don't want pens <laughs> in my classroom give me right. my number two dixon ticonderoga i don't want a dry erase board i want to get my pants covered in chalk dust every day <laughs> wait you're going to put a projector on my dry erase board and i can touch it no 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 we can't have that <laughs> I did a game show on one of mine for one of my guests. It was all about, uh, he's all about tech. And, you know, it was a tech episode. And uh, so I did the same thing um, uh, where I, I gave reviews of technology that would have been, you know, like at the time panned. And then, um, and then he had to guess what it was. So it was things like a book, a pencil, you know, but I, the way I described it was like the disgruntled person who describes technology now, you know, why do you need this, you know, newfangled thing when, so it was very cute. I'm curious to see how this will definitely change the way we teach it, it, it how we're going to bring about interdisciplinary lessons. Maybe we can start getting rid of some of the content we've been teaching forever. Maybe we can get rid of those ideas of I'm just going to teach this topic and help students understand the war of 1812. Like, I think, I think we're, we can really kind of figure out how we can connect these things with all the different classes. That might be how we can get that, that hybrid model of teaching that, that might be the way we can get students to stay home. That may be the way we can get students to find ways to participate more in their classes because they're doing it not just for one teacher, they're going to be doing it for four or five, six different teachers. And, and I think that is the shift that we can start focusing on. You know, it doesn't require technology. It requires, you know, new ways of thinking. And I think um, we talked about before, how do we shift that? I would love to see content being shifted instead of following curriculum, how we're going to tackle one part of it. We can start tackling everything together. I don't know how. I don't know who's going to start that. You know, and, and that's the thing, too, because we can have one school who wants to do all these wild and crazy things. But then when, it look at it, when you look at it from a state level and they're just going to say, no, that, that doesn't count. Because I know in New Jersey, we were all sitting here waiting. Do these days count? Do these days count? Do these days count? We finally found out, what, a month into this, that, yeah, the days are going to count. But we could have been stuck. We're, we were still in school in July because the governor closed school. So well, that's like could, a few episodes back. We had uh, Dan Krinas on, and, and mm, he was talking right. about how 
where he's at in Connecticut. In Connecticut, nothing was official. Right. So so again, like all the ideas that we have here, they're fantastic and I'm I'm glad we're pushing them forward. I, I just hope that again this this starts from the top and we can trickle it down or maybe the schools pass it to the top and they say, Hey, that's a really good idea. Which I think that's that's the way it has to be. Because I don't think the state has those those kind of ideas, to be honest with you. Well, there you go. If you're watching in a state that has a governor and they make decisions and you have state boards of education, be sure to send them to all of our content over the last six weeks <laughs> Yeah. where, you know, it's idea after idea from people who are in the trenches, neck high in virtual learning. All right. As we start to wrap up this episode of podcast PD, we still have Botsheva and Jake Miller with us. So before we say goodbye, uh, something we do like to ask guests is what is your ideal form of professional development? Because this is podcast PD. So I'll, I'll talk for a few more seconds to stall and Jake or Botsheva, whoever's ready to answer the question first, you just flash your hand here on the video and talk about your favorite form of professional development, either to give or to get. Rock, paper, scissors, Bacheva, who goes first? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to do scissors, but you can't see. Yeah. All right. <laughs> uh, you go first, Jake. Okay, so I, I so I am currently about halfway through reading uh, Jim Knight's book on instructional coaching. I'm blanking on the name of it. I, it might just be called Instructional Coaching, a something something model or something or other. Fantastic book. Right. And he, yeah, and he he talks about in it how you know, the, the data shows that the way we tend to do professional development, which is top down, you know, administrator picks it out and a uh, presenter comes in and presenter presents it all to everybody and everybody just has to take it and accept it. Uh, kind of like we do in our classrooms to an extent. Um, we know that it doesn't tend to have a lot of success and that the, the other data has shown and all that's in Jim Knight's book, but that when when to, when the teachers have some autonomy over what they're learning and they have some buy-in over what they're learning, uh, they get some deep professional development out of it. So I, I think that something, wh whether it is instructional coaching or whether it's just some kind of strategy where the educators are steering what they're learning about and choosing based on like, like AJ, you mentioned earlier, um, Simon Sinek's like knowing your why. Like if the educators identify their why and then they're given the support and the opportunity and the time to to learn about whatever that tool is or whatever that method is, or whatever that strategy is to get them to that why. Uh, and putting the educators in the driver's seat of it because we know that we that, that creates buy-in and they know their students and their content uh, best. And for for educators that don't, you know, we, we we guide them to help them make those decisions themselves, but they need to have some buy-in over what they're learning about. Yeah, I to add to that, I would say um, for me, my favorite way to do PD is to to give workshops because I do that kind of all over, you know, all over, all over. Um, I love conferences where there's lots and lots of great sessions, and teachers can pick where they want to go. Mm -hmm. And so they do have some, you know, they've chosen to go to this conference, hopefully, and then they can choose which session they want to go to. So they've so when they come to my session, it's because they actually want to be there, not because the administration told them and I know the difference because I've done both kinds mm -hmm. and so um, but when the people are there because they want to be there they want to learn that thing it's really exciting and all of the PD that I do is extremely interactive and hands-on and they come out with really solid tools because I'll never do something that's just me lecturing I hate there's nothing worse for me to be sitting in a at a conference or something, and just to be lectured for 45 minutes about how frontal learning is um, bad. <laughs> I, I remember sitting through a 45 minute lecture on experiential learning, and I was like, did we miss the irony in that? You know, it was like <laughs> super weird. But the other thing is that I love doing is mentoring teachers, like really one on one getting to brainstorm with them and and really collaborate and the the electricity between us is like they get something and then they they say something and it makes me think of something and i love that collaboration and then for me personally what i besides i like to go to the conferences where i get to choose where i'm going to be um i also really podcasts there are so many great educational podcasts i could just like 
sit all day and listen. And I love podcasts in general, but education podcasts are just awesome. So like you rattle off 26 like of, of my favorites. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> That, that, Bacheva, the points that you made there are great because they're all centering around the teachers having varying levels of choice, right? They're they're right. choosing what podcast to listen to, or they're choosing what sessions of that PD day to go to, or they're working with a mentor where they have a voice because they're collaborating with them. Or like Amy gave a suggestion in the chat there about ed camps because that gives the teachers some choice. So when the teachers have some level of autonomy, some level, it doesn't have to be right. complete autonomy. When they have some level of autonomy over it, you know, great things can happen. Yeah, that's really true. I once worked at, at the beginning in the, in the late 90s, I worked at a school that actually had teachers they, they really wanted teachers to start using technology. And this was like 98, 99. And they gave teachers a stipend over the summer to develop a technology project plus the support to do it. And I took advantage of that two summers in a row. And That's one of the awful. summers, my support was one of my seventh graders <laughs> was working wow. with me on something to use for my curriculum. It was incredible. So that's a kind of cool thing that schools could do, you know, yeah. if they really want to invest in their teachers. Yeah, I like that a lot, too. It'd be cool if there was kind of like a like a Shark Tank piece to it where you had to prove why you should get get to work on this project, uh, why you should receive that stipend for doing it. Uh, that's and an they, awesome have to, idea. they have to say like, yes, this this fits district goals or this fits best practices or this fits your content area or whatever it is. Right. That way, because we do know that there's some some red tape at the administration level that they just have like they just can't give us complete freedom you know, right. in most situations. So it, it's a good way for them to reward you with some autonomy right. um, and motivate you with some autonomy, but also be able to kind of screen the things go going on. Right. And it did. And it motivated me to get, that's when I started kind of really my tech journey um, with, you know, seeing how great it can be in my classroom and all the different things that it could do was really because of that school, you know, giving us that opportunity. So. Yeah. And speaking of opportunity, uh, again, we want to thank Jake and Bacheva for joining us this evening. Again, they are two fantastic content creators. They both create two awesome podcasts, and I'd like to have them let you know how you can connect with them if you're not already and how you can connect with their podcast if you're not listening already. And I'll be honest, you better damn well go subscribe to both of them <laughs> when you're done here. Mm -hmm. So Bacheva, and please Tim's. tell us one more. And Tim's as well. Yeah. Um, but Bacheva, please tell us once again about Overthrowing Education. So, yeah, I mean, Overthrowing Education. It's on every platform. And uh, you can go to the website is overthrowingeducation.com. You can tweet with me at Overthrowing Ed. And, uh, yeah, I really love to hear from people. So check it out. It's a lot of fun. I'm going to jump in and do mine now. So, so as, as Chris said, I, I host the educational duct tape podcast. So you can find it on all of the, the podcast apps and players and everything like that. Educational duct tape, D U C T not D U C K as Chris pointed out earlier. Um, but the website is also E D U duct tape.com. Uh, and you could find me on social media at Jake Miller tech. And, you know, for for those of you that aren't familiar with the show, th these are, um, this is kind of, not quite mirrors, but runs a little bit parallel to the way we do things on the show where we, we start thinking about a question that a teacher might have and identifying the ways technology can support us with that, right? And so hopefully there's there's five people that I need to have a get, as a guest on this this video right now. One's not on, one left already, but Tim and AJ and Stacy and Chris and, and Bacheva, we, we, need to, we need to make that happen and ask some educator questions and talk about how we could use technology to answer those questions. Yes. Definitely. I just want to do oh, a whole did. episode of truths and lies with you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so bad at it though. <laughs> That's great. All right. Yeah. All right, and anybody Stacey. who comes on my show, you have to be prepared to uh, play the five minute game show. Uh -oh. uh, and you're all welcome to, I'd love to have you all on and yes. And then you'll have to play the game show. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right, Stacy, it is that time. It do is the that magic. time. It is time to say goodbye, everyone. So say goodbye, Christopher. Goodbye, Christopher. Say goodbye, AJ. Goodbye, AJ. Say goodbye, Bacheva. Goodbye, Bacheva.
and say goodbye, Jake. <laughs> Why do I have to be fourth to do this? Goodbye, Jake. <laughs> Bye, Podcast PD. <laughs> All right, that'll give me a little silence to edit the episode, but we're still live on YouTube and Facebook. So have at it. There you go. <laughs> so you guys probably don't know this, but I used to wave every time we would say goodbye. And now she can finally meeting, wave and she doesn't and wave anymore. now when I wave, like it makes sense. It actually sense. means something. Right, you do it. Have you guys <laughs> seen the meme going around that has like, I think it's I think it's Laurel and Hardy in a, in a car and it says like everybody at the end of a Zoom meeting and somebody's like looking out the door and they're like, goodbye. And they're in the car like, bye, bye, bye. <laughs> like that's everybody to Zoom meeting. <laughs> that's the beginning of a Zoom meeting. Right. Hi, so, it's you. I see you. Yeah, no kidding. Like they've never <laughs> seen each other right <laughs> or used a computer this, before is this on can, can can you hear me right for most of us everybody's saying like you've got a nice microphone look at that <laughs> i haven't even used mine in a meeting oh you got it you got it's to you, like you impress some people <laughs> oh no I, I stay silent i don't talk in those meetings <laughs> i usually have, I a, have a camera on i usually if it's a zoom meeting i have a background on and it's usually like someplace like in Scotland or something like that from my travels. And it's so much more impressive than my mess back there. <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> it's green. It's kind of like a green screen. It, it like would it. be if something cool was happening back there. Yeah. It's really <laughs> just things thrown over more mess. It's really what it is. <laughs> and then I see that my husband put up a bamboo screen to cover the kitchen. I guess he thought. I need to make dinner and they don't need to see me make dinner. So I'm going to put the screen up. I was actually oh, talking so when like, it went up are... and I was like, what's going on? Back I didn't there? even notice it. <laughs> I did. I saw it. And then I was, and then I keep forgetting that it's like still early well, evening and not nighttime for you guys. Yeah. It's not even probably, seven o'clock. So. Probably back there chopping and dancing and singing. Got oh yeah. Got everything going on. Yeah. The AirPods are in. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Right. Everybody knows how to cook like that. <laughs> nice. That's what Chris does. That's why he videotapes himself all the time. Put that on TikTok, Chris. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, I probably do have to go um, have some dinner now. <laughs> well, I enjoy whatever it is, and uh, we'll have to talk to that voiceover guy. Yeah. No, he really he's he's awesome. I mean, he does he does my announcing, and then he does a lot of my commercials. Like he's the you know official um, announcer voice. Um, so yeah, it's pretty awesome. 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 Yep. Nice. So if anybody needs him, he's around. We have Ooh. our own sound booth. Nice. <laughs> That's, so That's awesome. That's awesome. All right. Bye, Amy. I see that you're leaving as well. Bye, Bye everybody on the chat. chat. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Everybody was great tonight. Chat, live, everybody. Awesome. I, yeah. I feel bad because awesome. there, there was a whole other conversation going on in I that know. chat. That, I know. But right. that, that's the joy of live. That's right. a good so chat. We'll, we'll write those questions down for another time. Absolutely. Take care. Bye, Take guys. easy, much, Eva. Thank All right, thank you, you again. Me. Thank Bye you. Bye. Yep. All right, guys. I'm off now. I've got to read. We're reading the end of the second book of the uh, Magic Treehouse series. Ooh. We've got to find out what happens with with the Black Knight. I don't know. Jack yep. and Annie just Jack just fell into the moat. I don't Can know. Can I spoil it for coming. you though? No, just a little bit. No, don't spoil no, no. It. That's messed I'm up. I'm just gonna say Jack and Annie magically end up back in the treehouse in How Frog Creek, you. Pennsylvania. How just, dare you? I just think that might happen. I don't Ruined know. It, it might. It. Might. I don't know how they would have like seventy other books if they hadn't made it back. We'll see. I will. I will tweet to you tonight, Stacey, and let you know what happens. Thanks. Let me know. <laughs> All right. Thanks for having me, guys. Bye. Thanks, Jake, thanks for coming you, on, Jake. Take care. We'll have you back. All right. And then there were, and there three, were three, and uh, yeah. we're gonna have a little uh, post game conference. So thanks everybody for showing up in the chat. And uh, happy Mother's Day. We will not be here live next week so if you're a mother well that sounded weird <laughs> <laughs> um, happy mother's day to all mothers everywhere there you go i'll leave it at that and uh we will see you guys Howdy in a mother. couple of weeks take it easy <laughs>